this is an, one of our old dryers. This is, well, actually, this is the newer part of the mill, the new building we put up in 82. You do it just about everything. You learn the whole mill, actually. But I started on the dryer, feeding the dryer. Then uh, from there, I bid on the green chain. I got on the green chain. I was on there for, I don't know, probably six years. Then I went into the machine shop, and I was there the remainder of the time. Because I was a machinist before I came here. You were a machinist before yeah. Before. You know, everybody works together as a team. Supposedly, you're supposed to. And, and you felt you felt that right off the bat. Oh, sure, yeah. absolutely. If you didn't, they were on you. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You had one person that didn't know his job and it screwed everybody up. Or you made somebody else work twice as hard to cover you. Well, it was 1951 that the organization was formed. To begin with, there was Oxley and Williams were the promoters, and they had signed up like 180 people, shareholders, and went, and meant, they meant to get four, 400, according to this prospect. Them, them promoters, they were going to operate the office. They were going to run the business. They were going to get 10% of the gross sales of your plywood that month to run the office. And 10% of the gross sales, maybe maybe you didn't make anything that month to begin with. Anyhow, you know, because a lot of months we, did, we didn't make money. And they were going to get 10% of the gross sales. Well, we, we couldn't see how we could survive on that at all. So then result was the membership, as it was organized, took over from these promoters and uh, ousted them without any great difficulty by merely following Oregon Co-op law. Which, looking back on it, I think it was rather unique <coughs> because the membership was largely formed of Scandinavian ancestry. Uh, a large number, large percentage, as I remember, were from North and South Dakota and Montana and further south into the Midwest. A number of Scandinavians from, Mis from Wisconsin, Minnesota. And here locally from people that had experience in agriculture and forest products. Electricians, carpenters, uh, millwrights. Uh, it was astounding and <clears throat> A lot of those people were people that had come from farms and from hard-working Midwesterners that would do anything. You, your job might be a specific thing like mine was carpentry, but you were willing to uh, do whatever was necessary. Didn't make any difference. A cooperative is just a layman's organization, you know, but you've got to have people within that structure because uh, everybody's going to be paid the same. So if you get people that are willing to take on the responsibility and stuff, and, and we did down here. You had, uh, you had people doing jobs, menial jobs, making the same pay as a a real craftsman, a highly skilled individual. 
and uh, it, you have to become accustomed to it. You think, of, well, that just won't work, but it does. It does. It's just uh, you all work together, do the best you can. I never really felt bad about getting the same pay as everyone else because uh, th that's what you bought into, you know. And uh, <clears throat> if, if we, anybody was going to make it around here, we'd all make it together. It would depend on the hours you put in. My feeling was that some of these people that did these menial jobs, they're getting uh, pretty good pay. They wouldn't make that much working in the company, but it's, uh, it's a boring experience, and they deserve something for be, being willing to do it. You know, over the years, I've worked with a lot of different people in co-ops. You know, I've worked at Multnomah as a non-shareholder, Milwaukee as a shareholder, Fort Vancouver as a shareholder, Linton as a shareholder. I've been in and out of a lot of co-ops. And uh, I, like, I like the environment within a co-op. And I've worked with a lot of people from socialist to communist to capitalist. And I would say that the bulk of the people that worked in these places were capitalists, even though they didn't really understand that, but they were. They were there for the money. A crew working together, if someone is not uh, doing his share, they'll get on him. If supervision doesn't correct it, the workers around him will. So we can't handle him in here. He's holding us back. We've got to have somebody that can keep up with the rest of us. World War II, there was a coming together of, of all sorts of men, women and children and everybody that saw what we were facing and something had to be done about it. And that carried over into this uh, feelings in, in this plant, actually. You know, that people just had a determination of we're gonna do this and we're gonna do it no matter what. When you came to came here before you could buy a share, you you would you would make an agreement to buy somebody's share and then you would do a trial period here. You would be assessed by the superintendent and by the foremans. They would do a two weeks assessment on you and ascertain your skills in all the levels of the, of the, of the mill. And they had a big sheet. You know, do you work on the dryer? Can you work in a shop? Can you work here? And, and your, your abilities in each one of those shops, in each one of those areas. So at the end of the day, when you became a member, we already had you through the mill. We knew where you could go. They knew where I could go. They had me pegged the day they said, Jimmy, you can, you, and the board had to authorize my purchase of the share. It wasn't very long be, between my purchase of the share, they saw where I should be working and sent me there and said, that's where we want you to stay. Yeah. And that's where I stayed for 17 years. So they were very good at assessing somebody before they got here. The culture was a little different when you get here because you find out that you all own the company, but in a lot of cases they all felt that they owned the company. And so you had 154 business partners down there, or 160 business partners, and you could have 160 different ideas of what to do today. It took a lot of getting used to for most people to bought in here. Uh, which crowd were you going to fit in with? Uh, what your beliefs were going to be. You know, uh, the work, work ethic was strong, but there would be a lot of in-house arguing over how to do things, you know. Um, do you pick up a piece of wood off the floor and put it in a cart, or do you throw it in a, in a hog, you know? And one guy would tell you that throwing it in a hog is going to get you a nickel and throwing it in the bin is going to get you a dime. And the next guy would say, well, it isn't worth the dime because it's going to take you too long to get it to there, so you throw it in there. And that kind of stuff went on all day long. And with 160 people, that got to be kind of confusing. On the other side, they knew what they wanted to do in a month's time. They knew that they wanted a certain amount of production in a month's time, and it was the high level, and they all worked to, to get there. And with all the confusion, they, made, they were able to make that happen. 
they kept making a high-end product. They made a lot of it. They were very, very efficient a as a group. But it could be testy sometimes. And well, Linton Plywood always approached the marketplace with, we want another dollar to a thousand from you, the customer, for our plywood, because it's worth more than that. And we largely, we largely proved, proved it to be true. And we were happy to compete in that market. And a goodly portion of that was attitude of the members. A high percentage of them had worked for themselves before they came there. Even as farmers, woodworkers, whatever, they saw the approach as working for themselves. Individuals working for themselves here's a group of equal owners operating in this business, they're going to be more conscientious of, and more productive than, uh, generally speaking, than a hired employee. The hired employee is going to just do what is necessary. Most of them do. But they don't have the incentive for making money, profit. It's a, it's a different, different situation. That's the manager, the owner's responsibility. And uh, it, all, it all just makes a big difference. Well, Linton was partially successful in their day because the difference was between a union mill, which I have a high regard for, and us, was a member would see a job that needs to be done, and if he had time, he'd do it without a foreman or anyone telling him to. And the new guy saw this taking place, so it became a way of life for him too. There really wasn't much slack time for anyone. And then there were guys trying to outperform the other guy because it was money in the pocket for everyone, plus the prestige, and it, it, was, an, it was an awareness thing, which to a degree was successful. That was a, one thing about co-ops, is that everybody had a right to be heard. Even if you were so wrong that it was just unbelievable. Even, even if your idea was just impractical, at least you had an opportunity to save. You, you know, you had to... You, and a lot of these ideas, if you sorted through them, there was some value to them, you know. It's just amazing, fantastic, the good workers we had. At one time, Lenton Plywood had the reputation of being the most efficient independent mill around anywhere. And uh, would go to the, would have an annual convention, American Plywood Association. And uh, I attended many of them, of course. And you'd have strangers approach you by your name tag. You're from Lenton Plywood. They want to talk to you because not to you as the individual, they just wanted to talk to somebody from Linton Plywood because of the reputation it had around the industry. And I don't take any particular personal credit for that. The entire uh, company had so many good workers. It's how I get that. And of course, we had pretty good management, but it all came down to the efficient workers in the organization. And it was outstanding. It's a great place to work. It really was. And I think a co-op, as few of them survive, as do survive, they're a magnificent thing for people to work in because you do have that sense of self-worth. Um, you're not concerned about being fired tomorrow. You can go to work tomorrow and do a very, very good job. And, and, uh, and if you're sick, you can do a slower job, and it's not going to affect you. you know, you're not going to worry about the boss coming out and firing you. And that kind of a culture tends to make you work a little, a little harder, I thought. Well, all, all the co-ops, we had annual meetings where we uh, would meet and, and elect the officers. And he off, they would be nominated from the floor, and, uh, and then they would be voted on. And th then they would be the directors for that year. 
uh, Linton was unique in a good way in that we had not only had our annual meeting, but we also had quarterly meetings. Every, every three months we'd meet over at the Key and uh, we'd have our own room and we would be, and it, when you only had the annual meeting, if, if a person's unhappiness was building up and it built up over a year, well, th then it would be an unpleasant experience in many cases when they would finally vent at these end. But where it was done on a quarterly fashion, where a person had a, and, and many of them were legitimate concerns and, and complaints or, or, or ideas of improvement. Almost all the stockholders would show up, and of course it was chaired by the, the president of the corporation, the secretary treasurer would be there. We would bring in legal counsel, and we would bring in uh, financial, our financial consultants, the CPAs, and they would sit up above, and we would sit out in the audience, and they would give their reports, and then we would ask them questions. And, and so you, you could ask whatever you wanted, you know. Whatever question you had, you could ask there for, for certain. If you weren't getting satisfaction from management here, or you could bring it up at that level. And uh, those would go on for two or three hours and get pretty heated, get pretty heated. Uh, because somebody wanted something done, and maybe he had support, maybe he didn't. And, and, and uh, it could be real rowdy yeah. and effective. It was almost pitiful to see someone, some new member, with a higher opinion of himself than most of us thought was justified to watch him campaign for office. It was pretty good entertainment, it really was. And this guy didn't have a clue. And yet here might be another one whose experience, background, and strength of character might get him elected second year. And the membership was seldom wrong. It was surprisingly, they were surprisingly accurate. Everything was open and above board at our membership meetings. You would have quarterly membership meetings four times a year. And the disgruntlement was all, all came out at that time, you know, and you had to take the heat and answer the questions. And then they'd make their resolutions or motions if there was anything needed and the board would act on that. I think it was just the protocol, the way the bylaws were set up, it was unique and it was very functional and it uh, worked great, I think. We had lots of controversies, you know, and uh, essentially uh, the members realize you're working for yourself and you wanna, you wanna reach a settlement as soon as you can, you know, and not it got bogged down. We had a few real, real bad situations, but uh, uh, it worked out pretty good. You know, you got the human element in everything, and uh, just like the city council, and everything else like that. You know? And uh, there's considerable politics. You could go to the meetings and you could stand up and, and, and make an attempt to be articulate and, and try to get something done. And sometimes, you, I, I'd say more time than not, I didn't say anything at the, meet, at the meetings. I just listened and was happy with the way things were going and, and uh, you know, uh, but at least the opportunity to say something. And when you work in a company like this where you really can't get fired, it, it makes you, after a while, a little more confident of what you're doing, a little more aggressive in your position because you can't get fired for having a position, you know. You can stand your ground pretty firm in a co-op. And uh, I like that, and so did the rest of them. So it was a healthy culture in that respect. If I had an idea or somebody in the department would come to me with an idea that made sense, we would sit around in the break room and people would be pretty brutal with some of the ideas because some of them weren't weren't good, but there was a lot of them that were good. And and, uh, and then if I thought it was okay, I would just go talk to the head mechanic, to go talk to Jim, and Jim say that doesn't sound bad to me. Let's see how 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 long it would take to get it done. So we talked to a few mechanics, 
Then we go talk to the purchasing agent. He said, yeah, I can buy that this afternoon, within reason. You know, I mean, if it was a huge amount of money, um, significant amount, but you know, I mean, if it was $100, $200, $300, you know, and, and, and we could see that it would work, you know, you did it. Generally, what happens is the board says, hey, we need a new layup line, for example. And we go out and get bids and prices and work up a proposal for the membership. They would approve it or disapprove of it, and it would come back for final approval. The board always had final say, but the membership had to approve over anything over $50,000. We had a lot of improvements down through the years uh, in the mill to make it more efficient, and that was a, always a problem. There's a certain number never wanted to spend any money for anything. Just keep operating the same old way, and you just could not do that and survive. You had to keep improving your mill. We would budget, or we would uh, propose every year what we'd want to do. Whether we could get it through the board or the membership was another thing, because everything had to, any capital expenditure had to, be, had to be voted on by the membership. Then it comes back to the board for finalization. And that was difficult. Uh, the individual uh, is interested in now and he's not interested in uh, having a reserve of timber or a reserve of money or uh, which makes it really difficult to be successful in the cooperative because they're more interested in self-preservation they like to think they're not, but that's the that, that's the the whole thing in a nutshell. There was people down here that didn't want to modernize. They didn't want to update. They'd rather use some bailing wire to keep it going and put more in your own pocket. There were a lot of reasons for the mill not to be successful. One was the com com competition from competing products. That was the biggest thing. I mean, when, when plywood was the only four by eight sheet of anything you could buy, you had a captive market. They'd announce a timber sale, and it'd be two, three years before you'd ever get, if you could ever get into logging. The cost of timber was going up drastically. Um, you could buy a timber sale and have it held up in court for years so you couldn't log it, so you had your money at, at risk. Uh, and you couldn't even cut the timber. The uh, market was opened up so that the taxpayer's timber could be bid on by foreign countries. You had people like Weyerhaeuser, Georgia Pacific, and big corporations that had timber to bid against. Uh. See, they were all at the table, along with the foreigners, and so it, it just put us completely out of business. So you you started buying veneer, and the veneer was coming from farmer logs or up from Canada or out of this area. When you buy veneer, somebody's already put that, a lot of expense into it, and that's that's what did us in. We just got to a point to where we couldn't compete anymore because of the price that you're paying for things. In fact, we had one sale at the Mount St. Helens eruption that got destroyed that we lost up there. And it washed down the Tudor River. When that spotted owl first came out, that just uh, devastated the whole industry. Our favorite expression is the owl wand. Lack of timber available from public land, which we'd always been happy to bid on. We were confident. If we could bid on it intelligently enough that if we got it, we could make a profit on it. That's all. We just did it a little better and or a little bit different than other mills did. We were referred to at one time as a Cadillac of the co-op mills. We are pretty much the last one to go down. The mill was built in 52 on, so the machinery was getting quite old and the machinery for a plywood mills in the millions. So. Uh, reinvesting in that kind of expense. 
There, there, were, there were mistakes made over the years, just trying to keep up with the industry and the, and the innovations of the time, you know. I look at it as, as a good experience. Uh, you never, ever even thought of a layoff. If you keep the company successful, you have a job. And you have control over your job. Whereas with a company, for whatever reason, say, well, they would just shut down this division, like you see every day in the, you know, hold on, just shut it down. We'll do this in Asia or what, whatever. I myself and family uh, did real well being in a co-op. It's all of us and what's best for all of us, not just for me. Well, the culture was pretty unique, you know. You come to work every day working with your, with your business partners, so um, we had to get along, we had to make the right decisions, and everybody was invested, so uh, we all watched how we handled the materials and how we handled the woods and the logs and the money. Uh, were we effective? Were we cost-effective? Uh, where we're getting things done that we needed to get done every day. So working in a culture where you're all partners every day is pretty unique and, and there wasn't an awful lot of turnover so you'd know these people for many, many, many years and, and uh, the culture was one of getting things done quickly, as cost effectively as possible and turning out a heck of a nice product because everybody wanted the best product we could manufacture and we probably did manufacture the best plywood. Uh, it was a fun atmosphere, and it was uh, everybody seemed to have a certain amount of respect for everybody else and their decision-making abilities, and even having the owners be the board of directors who made the corporate decisions was kind of nice because then you'd see them the next day and ask them how the board meetings went. So you would know everything from the top to the bottom every day. Uh, information flow was excellent because it was a co-op. Uh, a lot of arguments over how to spend money, but that's not unique here, I don't think. So the culture was fun and it was effective and it was a great way to spend your working career. You know. I'm gonna miss it. So that's the culture. Mm -hmm.